Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk you through five different ways that you can sell your work to shops if you're a creative and make your own product. Now I hope that what I'm going to tell you today will be useful if you are a maker yourself, but I also hope it will just be interesting if you're not. Now there are lots of different ways that you can get started in selling your products to shops and I want to talk you through my experiences with all the different ways that I'm telling you today, as well as some of the pros and cons for each one. Now, before we go any further, if you've just landed on this video and you've never seen my face before, let me introduce myself. My name's Dee and I'm a watercolour artist and surface pattern designer with my own small business, The Butterfly and Toadstool. I've been making and selling my own products for over six years now and I like to use these videos to show you the kind of behind the scenes of how I run my business and also do videos like this one where I'm giving you some hints and tips on the things that I've learned on my journey. So if these are the kind of videos that you like to watch, please consider subscribing to my channel by hitting that button below. Now, let's get on with the video. Now, before we leap headfirst into selling to shops, let me talk you through one of the most important things I think you should do. And this is going to be a little bonus that we're putting at the front here. And that is in-person markets. If you're absolutely brand new to selling, if you're brand new to making your own products and you're just trying to get your business off the ground, I highly, highly recommend that you start here. Doing face-to-face -face markets is one of the best ways that you can get face-to-face -face customer feedback that is true to life in real time. Now I know that can scare people so much that people might be critical to you and you might you know, hear some things that you don't really want to, but the truth be told is there is no better way to further your business than working off of feedback that you've been given. Now I know from my own experience, some of my best and most popular products came from kind of collaborating with customers during face-to-face -face markets. Now what I mean by this is if you're doing a market stall and you have your lovely products all set up and people are coming to you and they're chatting to you, they may give you some ideas that you haven't thought of before and this can be something that goes with an item that you already have, something in a different colour way that they're more prone to at the moment, anything like that you should be soaking in like a sponge and using for your business because there's no better feedback that you can get really is from customers who are genuinely interested and who like your product and a really good way to find those people is at face-to-face -face markets. Now again this is something that I know a lot of new business owners are quite worried about, they don't like to be in front of people and they find it quite awkward and they don't want to like sell 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 in people's faces. That's not what I consider that markets are about, it's more about the networking. It can be networking with other makers, also with people in your local area but mostly it is just about getting that feedback and those um, thoughts and feelings from other people when they're visiting your stall. Now I know for me when I was doing my first market stalls getting in front of people for the first time and really hearing what they had to say was really important to me because I'm not sure about you but as an artist I work on my own. I work alone in my home studio. I don't have people to give me feedback and the people that I do have to give me feedback are my lovely friends and family who are obviously going to be supportive of me and say nice things and that's great and obviously that's very useful and I hope that you have that too, that support. But I think it's really important really crucial actually to get that from others. Now, I'm just going to quickly put in a little disclaimer here. Yes, there will always be that one person <laughs> that's going to say something not kind, they maybe just didn't think it through properly or it maybe just came up across a little bit mean, let's be honest. And yes, I have had that. <laughs> um, and I honestly just think the best way to think about it, if somebody has a problem with either your product, your pricing, that's usually something that people might bring up, um, or anything else about your business, all you have to do, don't react to it, don't get upset about it, don't absorb it, just think those people are not your customer. And that is absolutely fine because believe it or not, not everybody is your customer. And that's another really great way of finding out your customer is by doing in-person events because you're going to start seeing the people that come and are interested and they love your things and they buy from you and they talk to you about it. You're going to find trends in those people and that's because they are your people and that's who you want to be in, in front of and, and, and marketing to. So again, take that as positive. If somebody says something nasty, they may be just having a bad day. Don't take it personally and just move on. It's not going to be every person and don't let it put you off doing in-person markets thinking that that's going to be something that somebody's, everybody's going to say to you, they be critical because it's not, it really isn't. Another great thing about in-person markets is that you get to see your products from a customer's point of view. And again, this harks back to what I've just been saying. You're going to talk to customers, they're going to like, you know, mention things about it. They're going to talk to you about the colours or the 
way that you set up your display, all these different things. And that's really great, but it is, you have to take that as look from their eyes. How are they seeing your products? How is it being displayed to them? Is it clear? Are they all asking you the same questions over and over again? Because that means it's not clear. Maybe your signage isn't clear um, or something about it maybe isn't clear. If the same question that they're concerned about is coming up and up. There again, take that with you as something to move forward with. And um, so I would definitely say wherever you are in your um, creative business, always look to do in-person markets every so often. If you're if you're brand new to this, I would say jump into them. Try and do ones that are local to you. Try and do events that are organised nearby you because they really are invaluable for the things that you'll learn from them. So that is your bonus tip. And now we're going to get into the five ways that you can sell your products to shops. So one of the first ways that I got to sell my products in shops was doing something called shelf rental. Now it kind of is exactly what it says on the, on the tin. You, as the artists, pay a shop to rent space on a shelf for you to display your products in that shop. And what usually happens with that is you'll pay this fee monthly, it'll be set out by the shop depending on how much space you're getting, whether it's just a shelf or a cabinet or whatever it is that suits your products. There'll be a, a set fee that you pay every month and then any sales that you make, you get 100% of that cash back to you. Now this is something that's offered usually by small independent shops and this is kind of to safeguard them into seeing what products are going to suit their shop and in that case you know you can do shelf rental just month by month and if it's not working out for you it means that your product's just not selling in that shop it's they don't have the customer right for your product and it's time to move on but on the other hand of this you could find that that is your perfect customer and that it ends up being you know you could be the best seller in that shop and that is something that happens quite regularly in people that do this this way of selling to shops didn't actually work for me and, and this is the reason that I'm putting this one first. It's kind of the one that I class as the lowest one and I'm about to explain to you why. Like I've said before, this could be amazing for some people and it definitely depends on your products, the shop that you choose and the location of that shop. But I'm about to give you some of the cons that I found as to why this didn't work for me. Number one is pick a shop that is actually going to be open. And this sounds so ridiculous, but one of the shops way back when I was very, very new that I tried was in a very small village. It had just been bought over by a lady. She was just starting doing the shop for the first time. But unbeknownst to me, she actually still had a full-time job which meant that she only opened her shops on a Saturday morning. So from that Saturday morning, that was maybe four Saturdays if I was lucky a month, that I had Saturday morning for a couple of hours. That was the only time that I had to potentially sell something. Yet I was still paying her every month a fee, which in my eyes was just helping her keep the shop open. It wasn't helping me sell any products. So that's one of the things I would watch out for. And again, that was just an error on my behalf. I thought it was great because it was a brand new shop, but I didn't really look into how the shop was going to be run. So again, take my advice and do those checks before you jump into this. Now, number two would be to check that the shelf rental cost works with the price of your products. Now, what I mean by this is when I did shelf rental, I was selling jewellery. Now, it, it wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't real gold. It wasn't silver. It was on the cheaper side of jewellery. It was costume jewellery. And it was quite small things. It was small brooches and small earrings. So my price point at that time was between four and 12 pounds per item. Now, considering that my shelf rental was about 15 pounds a month, that meant that I had to at least sell two pieces of jewellery just to pay the shelf rental. So every month, if I was only selling two pieces of jewellery or less, I was then out of pocket because I was paying for the shelf rental, but I wasn't making money back. Now, if I sold over two pieces of jewellery that were took me over the £15 mark for the shelf rental, that had to be over enough to have accounted for the amount that I spent to make the products that I had just sold. Otherwise, I was still out of pocket. So I would always say, check the cost of your products against the shelf rental price to make sure that you're gonna realize how many items per month that you're gonna to have to pay to cover that cost. Number three is more of a piece of advice. If you find a shop that you want to work with and they only offer shelf rental, I would suggest asking around. Ask other artists and makers who already stock that shop how they find the shelf rental process, how they find their sales, are they making money, and if the shop is just busy in general. And that will really help you to make up your mind to see if shelf rental is gonna be right for you. The next way that you can sell to shops is called commission. Now this is when the shop takes a small fee for them selling your products. And so you will get 
the money for each product that sells that month minus a commission. And a commission would usually be anywhere between 20% to 40% of the sale price of that item. Now again, this varies depending on the shop, it depends on the location, and it depends on a lot of different things. And it's the commission is set by the shop, it's not set by you, it's set by the shop. And that will be across the board to all the artists that they are stocking in their shop at that time. That might seem a lot of money to be taken away from you, but you've got to also think the shop is giving you space in their shop. They're also giving you the staff to sell your stock. You don't need to be there. Same with shelf rental. You give your stock over to the shop and it sits in the shop and sells like any other product in their shop. So that's a space in the shop. The staff to sell your stock um, and also the packaging for them to then package anything that does sell from you to their customers. So that might be tissue paper if they wrap it in tissue paper and put it in a bag, there might be stickers, there might be a, a business card, all those different things. The shop has to pay for that because that's an expense from the shop and that's why they will take a commission from you. This is something that I've done in the past as well. It did work well for me. There were a few things that were quite difficult for me to keep track of. I'm about to go into that in a minute, but I think it's one of the most um, reasonable ways that a shop can offer to take your stock is usually on commission. So it definitely is something to look into. The little cons I found were, again, more personal to me, was that at the time I had quite a few shops. I think I had maybe about 12, 12 to 15 shops that were all selling on commission. Now, when you first approach a shop and they decide that yes, they're going to take on your stock and yes, it's going to be on a commission basis, they will usually give you a contract to sign. And in that contract, it explains things like the commission that you'll pay and the dates that you'll get paid. It's usually monthly, sometimes it could be fortnightly. Um, and that all those kinds of terms for the shop and that's great um, read through them very carefully and then if they seem like something that you want to go with sign them and hand them back to the shop the thing that I then found difficult was with my between 12 and 15 shops at the time they all had different contracts because they were all different shops they all had different ways of paying me they all had different ways of keeping track of stock and they all had different uh, commission rates and so that fell on me to have a system to track that. And that is where I fell short. <laughs> and I'm just gonna be really blatant and honest and say I found that extremely difficult. Mostly because, again, I was selling jewelry at the time, it was quite small pieces, but they were also, could be something very similar, but varied. So there's variations in the same things. Now the shop might, some shops were, very rigorous and they gave each item a code and then that code related to the specific item and I got given a list of the codes and so I knew everything that sold very very rigorously and then I had on the other side of the scale shops that would might just say earrings sold and I had no idea what they were, I had no idea what colour, no idea what shape, no idea what size so I found it really difficult for me to keep track of actually what stock they had left now that's fine if it's a local shop, you can literally walk in with a pad of paper and note down the things that are left. But these shops were not near me at all. And it became harder and harder and harder as the months went on. And I was just getting paid, but I didn't know what, what, what was getting paid for. And then that meant I didn't know what stock the shop had left. So then I couldn't restock the shop because I didn't want to give them the wrong things. And it just became a bit of a muddle. And again, that fell on me. I didn't have a good enough system, um, but I, I really struggled with that. And that's one of the reasons that I, I started to come away from that. But at the time it was great. I made very good sales with that. It was worth financially for me to do that. And it helped me also get my name out there because I was selling in shops. I had my own branding obviously on my products and that was getting spread every time I sold something through that shop. So it is definitely um, a plus, I would say that is definitely a way to go, but I would just say put a proper system in place and I would say be rigorous and do what some of the best shops did, code your own items. And I know it's a headache, it takes ages, it sounds rubbish, but in the long run it's so much easier and well worth your time doing it. Now, just something else to take into consideration while we're talking about selling on commission is that the upfront cost that you're going to have to be able to get started in this. And what I mean by that is when we're talking about selling commission, we've said that that is producing an amount of stock that then goes to a shop and that shop sells it on your behalf and pays you down the line as those sales have come in, minus the commission that the shop keeps for themselves. Now that means that you're going to have the upfront cost of the materials that you need and the packaging supplies that you'll need to make those products shop ready to then give over to the shop to sell. Um, that can be something that people find quite daunting, especially if it's something if you're making fine jewellery that's an expense. That is, this might be something that maybe puts you off doing commission and I can completely understand why. Um, it also means that you will need to really manage your cash flow because the money that you're going to get from those sales is going to come in kind of dribs and drabs over the next kind of couple of months as your products sell through. But it does mean that your money that you've paid in expense to, to make those products and package those products is kind of held up in that store 
stock as it's sitting there. Um, so that's just one thing to, to consider if it is something that you want to start with. Start small if you can. Um, that's why I said try do markets and pop-up shops to kind of get a feel of where your products really are going to be a best fit because you just don't want to have so much money tied up in, in stock that you've placed all over in these shops and it's just not moving. And um, that can be something that's quite stressful. So just be aware of that. There is an upfront cost to commission and your money doesn't always come straight back um, to you. It does take, take a little while. Next, we're going to talk about pop-up shops. Now, pop-up shops really are kind of how it sounds. It's where an artist pops up their stuff in a shop for a set amount of time. Now, it, this is something similar to an in-person market. Um, it depends on the shop, it depends on their policies, but it usually is that the artist will maybe take, say, a long weekend, say it's a Friday to a Monday, um, and the artist will go, they will set up a little table or a display in the shop, and they will stay with their products in that shop and either sell it themselves or help sell it through the shop. And at the end of the time, depending on the way that the shop has had it set up, you either pay the shop some money from you being there in the shop, or they might take a commission on the sales, or however it is. That's how it would usually be done. And that is a nice way of kind of introducing your stock to that shop. So whether it is that you're trying to get into sell commission with that shop, maybe you could suggest, if they weren't really sure if the products are right for them, maybe you could suggest, well, why don't I try a pop-up shop? I could do a Saturday, Sunday for the next three weeks and we'll see if the products are selling with your customers. And that's a good way just to kind of introduce yourself and then you can maybe go on to do other things. Now, like I've just mentioned before with the commission, when you're selling on commission, you have to produce and have the money to produce an amount of stock first that you give out. So you've paid money, you've made all your stock, you've given it to a shop and then they've sold, they sell through it and you get money kind of dribs and drabs every month as it goes on. With a pop-up shop, you can do it on a smaller scale. So you maybe don't have such a big outlay to start with. And again, it can then introduce your ideas and your products to that shop, which can then lead on to things like commission. And you've kind of maybe made some money that you can then invest to make more products that can then go to that shop or another shop in your area to then sell commission and such like. So it's really nice way to kind of move on your business from a very small stage and grow it gradually. I, I like pop-up shops for that reason. So number four on our list is events and galleries. Now hosting an event and hosting a gallery is something different in a pop-up shop because it usually involves more than just you as an artist. Hosting a gallery is something that can be done if you are an artist and you have friends that are artists and you're maybe all trying to break in and get, get your names out there at the same time. You can rent a space and you can collaborate together to host this gallery, this kind of showcase of all of your work together. Now again, I have taken part in things like this and it works really well over times like Christmas time when it's gonna be busy and people are gonna be looking for different places to shop. Um, it can also just be nice sort of seasonally um, if you have artist friends who work with something that's similar to you or sits nicely with you, um, you can work together to kind of put together a gallery. If you're a full-blown artist, hosting a gallery is something that I hope that you are gonna be thinking and looking into anyway because I think if you do big paintings and things, the best way to showcase that is in a lovely gallery space it's going to give the space for your art it's going to showcase it in the kind of the proper way it's going to let people really see the, the size and the scale of the artwork that you produce but hosting a gallery doesn't need to just be if you paint canvases <laughs> um, like I said I've taken part in a gallery before it was with a group of my friends and um, we held together, it was over a Christmas time and we did it, it was like a pop-up shop, it was hosted separately and it was in a little village um, that we did but it was a nice way to introduce ourselves to the local shops at the same time. So as well as yes we wanted customers to come and obviously we would like to have sales and that was all great but speaking to the local shops to say would you like to come and have a look at our work, this is how it looks when it's on display. That was a great way and that actually led to me having my work as commission in some of the local shops further down the line. This also gives you some of the really good feedback that I was talking about at the beginning of this with in-person markets. When you host a gallery or you're holding your own event, you are there as a person. You have to be present. It's not like when you're selling commission and you just kind of give your stock to a shop and let them deal with it. You are there. And that really helps, I think, tell your story properly to a customer. It's not coming secondhand from someone else that's kind of heard it. It's you. You can explain exactly who you are, what you do, why you do it, what inspires you, all those things that really help connect people to the products that you're then trying to sell. I think hosting galleries in your area is a really nice way of connecting with other local artists and makers. And these will possibly be people that you've met through markets if that's how you started out. I can assure you that some of my best friends that I have now, I met doing markets because they are very similar thoughts to me. They've got their own creative markets. And although we make completely different products, 
they gel well together and they sit really nicely together in a gallery kind of space. So that's something that I think that you should look for um, when you're thinking of hosting something like that is to look at people who, yes, they'll do different things from you, but that it all sits and complements your work really nicely together and it really helps tie an event together and make it more memorable for the customers who'll be shopping it. Now last, but by no means least, number five on our list is selling wholesale. Now if you're brand new to selling and this is a term that you're not really sure about what it is, it's basically defined as the business of selling goods in large quantities and at low prices, typically to be sold on by retailers at a profit. Now this at a profit <laughs> part relates to both you as the designer, the person who's making the product, and also the retailer, the person who will be selling on, to the end person who's the consumer, the customer. And so the most important thing if you want to get into selling wholesale is that you must work out your prices properly. And I mean to the penny, the, everything has to be worked out, all the costs have to be covered. And I don't just mean the cost of the materials it make, takes for you to make that item. I mean the cost of the materials, the cost of the packaging, the cost of your time. Every time you make a product, you're taking up your time and you must be paid for your time or you don't have a job. <laughs> um, you also need to do packaging, posting. So all the things that you will um, package your items up in, whether that's boxes, tissue papers, you know, cart packaging, whatever it is, you have to factor the price of those in. Shipping costs, um, taxes that you need to pay, and right down to the equipment that you use, like I have printers that I run, they run on electricity, which I have to pay, that has to be covered. The ink needs to covered, the paper needs covered. All of the things right down to absolutely everything that you use needs to be incorporated into your prices to make sure that you're selling your wholesale correctly. And I have to say that no one in this world will succeed at selling wholesale correctly if you haven't worked out your prices. And I really mean that by the heart. And I'm only telling you this because I want you to do well. <laughs> and I know it seems scary and I know it seems daunting but take the time to work this out because it's the most important thing. Now there are little exceptions to this and I have to put this out there that I personally believe that not every item can be sold at wholesale price and you, this will depend on who you are, what you make and where you live. All these different things are taken into consideration but what I mean by this is I make printable products so my time and the things that I use to work out my prices includes the original design time. So the paints that I've used, the paper that I've used, the time I've taken to scan it, the time I've taken to digitize it, all these things to make that one design. But once I've made that one design, I can print that as many times as I want on different cards. Say we're talking about greetings cards. I could take time, I design a greetings card, um, design and then I can print it as many times as I want. So therefore, yes, it might be a very slow po process at the beginning, but spread over all the, the hundreds or thousands of products that I could make with that one design, I don't need to charge that price for every single product. And that's why greetings cards are a cheap product because you can make them, design them one time and then sell them on and on and on. With the regards to products that won't sell well um, at wholesale is things that are bespoke and things that are maybe larger um, products. So things like bespoke furniture, um, maybe even bespoke ceramics might not even work with this. Um, maybe bespoke clothing might not work. Bespoke jewellery that's of high quality, so like if you're using real gemstones, real um, gold or silver, things like that. Things that cost a lot of money, but also cost your time, are things that maybe don't work so well for wholesale. And that, like that, when I'm speaking, say we're talking about bespoke furniture, those are large items. They are going to take you a very long time to make. They're going to use up a lot of materials to make as well. So therefore the baseline price that you have to charge for that product is already high. Now if you're selling that straight to the customer, that's fine because whatever profit margin you get in there is yours, it's your profit. But if you then try and translate that into wholesale, you still have to cover this very high price that it's taken you to make that item to be able to pay yourself for all the time and effort that you've put into it. But then the shop must be able to make a profit on that to then sell it to the end customer. And there's a there's a like a kind of level, like a top level here, which if you tip over, it's not gonna work. And that's because there's only so much money that a customer is going to spend on a particular item. And if your item ends up being more expensive than that, they will not buy it. And that does not mean that your item's not good enough for it. It just means that it's gonna be best for you to sell directly because all the profit goes to you. Whereas if a shop was to do it, they almost double. Usually it's double the price of wholesale. So whatever price you would make, say it, 
just take a random figure, it's £150, a bespoke chair um, would be for, for you, you would be, that would be your wholesale price and that makes it covers the prices for you, it also gives you some profit. That means the shop has to sell at £300, double that, for the shop to make a profit on that because they've already spent money on, on the product. Do you see what I mean? So the, the shop has bought it at £150. To make that back and make profit, they need to double that price. And so, yes, a customer might buy it, um, the chair at £200, which means that you as the maker would have made extra money. You've already covered your costs and a little bit more, and you're also making a profit on it. But £300, that's maybe too much for the... the customer and nobody would buy at that so there are certain things you you will need to work out if your products are suitable for wholesale and that's what what I mean by that is there is a top line that customers will um, buy products at that means there's also a top line that shops will buy products at because they're very aware of the levels that their customers will shop to and um, but if it's normal things if we're talking like normal artwork things that are you know repeatable and um, even some jewelry stuff if you can um, make it in maybe batches and um, candles can be sold soap can be sold lots and lots and lots of things can work for wholesale that's absolutely fine but there are some things um, that are maybe very artistic and very bespoke that would not work for wholesale the next thing to consider if you want to sell wholesale if you've worked out your pricing and you have figured out that yes your products work for wholesale and yes you'll be able to make a profit and yes the shops will be able to make a profit and the customers will still be happy <laughs> there's a still a few more things to consider before leaping into this and the main one for me to um, to share with you is quantity now like I said with the definition wholesale buyers buy in bulk so you as the maker must be able to produce your product on bulk on mass if you're wanting to sell um, on wholesale and that is really because you must be able to keep up with demand and um, like be able to actually fulfill orders that come in and um, you don't want to get a bad name of not being able to fill orders or being late on orders and things like that you want to be able to fulfill them on time and have a system in place that is like a you know maybe you get like a little factory going in your own shop and you you can work your way through things and, and get those um, orders out but that's something that you really need to consider as well Pricing is number one, but quantities, volume and quantities is something that else you have to consider. And I would say the last thing which kind of joins on with the quantities thing is postage. Please, please, please check about postage for your products because again, some things like me, I sell paper products um, and that's fine. I also sell mugs, I sell ceramic mugs and there can be breakages with that. They are a delicate thing, they're fragile, they can be broken. So you must figure out ways of posting your products. If you're making pottery, um, things that are breakable or glass things that are breakable you really need to have invested your time and effort into making sure that the packaging that you've chosen and that you have for your products um, will will stand the test of the postage time but also will stand up in a shop like how is how are customers going to be able to see that item safely um, and purchase it and be able to take it home safely and things as well so those are the kinds of things I would say they're the main things that I would think about and spend your time working out if you want to get into selling wholesale. So that's everything for today, guys. That was a really, really long one. Thank you so much if you stuck all the way to the end here. That's a lot of information I've kind of thrown at you, but I hope that you can find some value in that, even if it's just interest. If you don't make things yourself, I hope that you found that interesting and maybe see some of the background at what goes into people who, like myself, create things and put them into shops for hopefully you guys to buy. Um, but yeah, I really, like I said, I hope you found that interesting. If there's any other points or questions that you would like me to clarify, or if there was anything else that you thought of in that video, please let me know in the comments below I'd love to chat with you um, and I like building this little community that we're getting on YouTube I really appreciate you all being here and um, thank you to everybody who has subscribed already and who watches my videos regularly I really really appreciate you um, and so yeah I just want to say thank you for that and I hope that was helpful so have a good weekend guys and I'll see you next time bye say it would be definitely who is drilling <laughs> Please excuse my neighbour's hedge trimmer that's happening right outside the window. <laughs> Summertime. Okay, back to this. Number three, I would say, would be to. Oh no, what is number three? <laughs> oh no, here she comes. What was Mummy going to say? Quick, think. Oh yeah. And number three, I would say, here comes she goes. Take it back to the toes. Number three, I would say that if you are wanting to work with a shop and they only offer shelf rental parts, please stop walking in I'm so close to having this filmed. And number three would be if the shop that you...
Bye. <laughs> I see my dad, you're so pretty.